So we're into the, the chaos, if you like, of FTX, uh, which Sam creates because he decides that all crypto exchanges are flawed and therefore he makes his own. There is a delicious description, which you must give us, of a phone call between Sam Bankman-Fried and Anna Winter at the height of his celebrity. Well, well so when, when, this, when FTX is making vast sums of money. Does everybody know who Anna Winter is? Uh, yeah, I think so. So, Editor so of Vogue. Sam didn't. <laughs> so, and, and, uh, and, and, which was, so I will take you to this, I'm going to have to give you, I'm going to have to give you a little context, because I, for me, the delight is partly the context. I had just started, can I watch? He says yes. Watching just means following him around. Um, we, we, I go to the Bahamas, he says, oh, we got, we're going to, the, we changed our minds, it's not the Bahamas this week, it's the Super Bowl. This is February of 2000, of last year. We get to, we get to, Beverly Hills, California, and uh, he says, I got a bunch of things that they want me to do, but I don't know which I'm gonna do. There's a, long, there's a menu of celebrities that wanted to spend time with him. And he was trying to figure out which, uh, celebrities including the CEO of Goldman Sachs, because uh, everybody's at the Super Bowl. And he says, there's, the first thing is this party. He says, it's, I got this address and I got this name, but I don't know this guy. And, I don't, and he says there are gonna be all these important people there, but I don't know. Sam's has a small entourage who are continually freaking out that someone's gonna kidnap Sam because he's the most kidnappable person in the world. He is, he's completely oblivious to what's going on around him. He's in shorts and a t-shirt and unarmed and, and has no muscles and, and, and has $22 billion worth of crypto or whatever. He has enough crypto and crypto is like the best ransom. So they say, you can't go to this party if you don't know who this is. He says, I think I wanna go. And so they follow behind him and wait outside the house in Beverly Hills where the party is in case he's being kidnapped. And I go in with him. I've never heard of this person either. The man's name is Michael Kivas. He was a former Hollywood agent. We walk, we walk through the house into the backyard where the party is and there may be 60 people there. This is a short list of who was there. Hillary Clinton, four Kardashians, Leo DiCaprio, Chris Rock, owners of two NFL football teams, Katy Perry, Kate Hudson, Orlando Bloom. It's like an average Saturday no, night at my house. Jeff, you know what? I've always thought Jeff Bezos. Jeff Bezos. So it, went, it was everybody. It was the mega, the wattage was incredible. So this is the first, so, and within about 30 minutes, the clusters of people, you see the conversations, everybody's around Sam. They all want to talk to him. At the end of it, this is funny, at the end of it, the host, uh, who figured out who I was, comes over and says, you really, I really want you to meet Hillary Clinton. I'd never met Hillary Clinton. So I went out, she's leaving, she's very sweet. It's fun to talk to. I go on the front lawn, there she is in the dark, and I, all by herself, and I say hi, and she says, uh, she, she looks at me and she says, what are you doing here? Because <laughs> I'm not A-list. And, and, and I said, well, this is odd. I've just met this person. I'm just trailing around behind him because I think there might be a book. And she goes, the guy with the hair. <laughs> and I said, yes, how did you know? She said, I talked to him. I thought he's a character for you. So, but anyway, so we've just come from this back to the hotel next morning. He says, I got some meeting. I don't know who this person is. It's a zoom. I said, can I just sit in and watch? Because now I know I want to see everything. And, and, he's, and I go into his, it's just me and him in his hotel room. He doesn't sleep in his hotel rooms. So this is, there are many bizarre things, but he'll be in a place for three nights and you don't know where he slept. I think he, the dumpster, but just if he has something about, he, you know what it is? He, he's incredibly uncomfortable sleeping alone. Right. Like he needs comfort. That's why he sleeps on a beanbag in the office. He, he can't, it's something, whatever's going on in his mind. So on the screen, Zoom, Anna Wintour, and he, he does not know who she is. He doesn't know what the purpose of the meeting is. He doesn't know, well, the purpose of the meeting is, can Sam bankman fried pay for the whole Met Gala? If that's the purpose of the meeting. Because he'll pay for everything else, why not that? And she comes on the screen and she is dressed to the nine. She's got those sighs of hair coming down around her chin. She's like ready to kill. And, and gorgeous, you know, she looks great. She's well prepared. He's playing storybook brawl, which is his video game. And whenever she comes on the screen, he blacks her out and the video game pops up. So like she's, she's talking and, and monster, minotaurs are killing 
are killing dwarfs and, and, and trees with axes are coming in and like, you know, the, the, the weapons are appearing on the screen and people are dying and exploding and, and, and you're hearing her talk about the Met Gala. And, and there's seven minutes in when he hits a button and the w Wikipedia entry for the Met Gala comes up so he can figure out what the hell she's talking about. And, and, and he's doing, I watched him do this. He's doing this with her. This is what he was doing on live television when he would be interviewed by Bloomberg TV. It was like, he, and he, he had tricks. It took him about one-tenth of his brain to have a conversation with, with Anna Wintour. And the, 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 what he would do, he, the, other, the other part of his brain was either reading about who she was or playing his game. And uh, what he'd do is he'd say, you ask me a question. He'd say, oh, that's a really good question. It's a really good question. Let me think about that for a minute. You know, meanwhile, the Minotaur is killing the tree and, <laughs> and he comes off and then he thinks for a minute and he says some boilerplate thing. Or, and, and he did this thing. This is where I first became aware of this tick. And then I had to trace it back to actually it was a theory of how to go through life with Sam Bankman Freed. He never said no. He never disagreed. He agreed with everything she said, every opinion, every suggestion, every proposal. It was yup. That's a great idea. That's really interesting. She left that call thinking she was never going to have to put on, she, the Met Gala was going to be paid for for the next 20 years. Mm. And, she, and afterwards, he gets off it. And I said, I look at him. He, he's such a schlub. You know, like, you can't imagine that rolling up a red carpet with Anna Wintour. I, I, I said, I mean, I didn't know his, I didn't know then his principled objection to actually dressing well. Uh, that he had a whole argument about people spending way too much time caring about their appearances. I knew nothing about that. But I just looked at him and I said, like, do you realize what you just agreed to do? Like, you want to go? He said, I don't want to go. He says, I, I, I have to think about this. I said, do you know what it is? Kind of, you know, sort of. And, and it, it was clear he had not even started the process of deciding whether he was going to give her a nickel or go. She thinks he's going to be here a date and she, he's going to pay for the whole thing. And of course, it created an enormous mess down the road where he says he's not going. But the whole thing about giving people the impression that he just was agreeing with them, he said that that's something he learned right, right as he was coming out of Jane Street. Actually, it was after the schism. But when he had to start to be a real social creature, like sell his ex exchange to people, which was such an alien thing, he realized, he said, what did he say? People like, he said, I found that people like you a lot more if you agree with them. And so it became the algorithm. The algorithm was just agree with people. And I'm sorry I'm going on here a bit, but I, I tell you, one of the things that came up over and over and over, and I don't ever say it in the book, but a shrewd reader will pick it up, is that what we're watching here feels a little like a foreshadowing of AI dystopia where you, you've given instructions to a machine, and it is, but you've not given much in the way of nuance to the instruction, and the machine does what it does with the instructions in ways you never imagined. So you say, uh, you say uh, get me a, a, a reservation at the Dorchester restaurant. I assume they still have a restaurant. And you don't tell it how to do it. And it goes and finds that the Dorchester restaurant's fully booked. So it starts murdering people who has reservations at the Dorchester restaurant. <laughs> That's what we're watching here. And, and, and but but you, you take him at face value. I mean, by this stage, he was giving huge amounts of money away. I don't take him he, at face value. Well, you, you've got to Bullshit. Be, you've, I don't take him at face value at all. Well, My okay, God. so let me, let me ask a question right. rather than making an assertion. Is he, is he sincere? Did you believe in him? How much of this was genuine? Could anyone be that otherworldly who had chosen to live in a multi-billion dollar complex in the Bahamas? Yeah. Who, yeah, so, so, so the, you don't appreciate how great this story is unless you appreciate how deeply wedded to the effect of altruism stuff he was. It was not for show. It, it was, the, so the, 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 this condo keeps coming up because it's like the one example of material. That, he didn't buy them in the first place. His, his, but he didn't seem to care about what care. happened to the money. If well, he actually but, cared but the about money, the effect of altruism. He needed, there was a reason he bought these when you go to the Bahamas and you need to move, move 150 people from Hong Kong overnight into the Bahamas who don't want to go to the Bahamas, you better give them a nice place to live. And there wasn't a whole lot of other, you try to buy that kind of property. And it also, he thought it was just going to hold his value. He, he was not, I, I, I said this on television the other day and I got in trouble for it, but it's absolutely true. If you gave Sam Bankman Fried a choice, uh, spend the rest of his life in jail with an internet connection 
or spend the rest of his life in that Bahamas condo without one, he'd r- much rather be in jail. Yeah. That, that, that's not what gets him off. What gets him off is the information flow. And the, he was, the material stuff, he's kind of, he's, he is, people around him were not indifferent to it. Nobody around him was indifferent to it. But that's, that part's real. The effective altruist part, the, the wedded to it, it's his, it was his identity. So that part's real. Now, they're, part, they're problematic parts, but you got to accept that's real if you want to understand this person in the story. Okay, a couple more from me, and I, I'm keen to open up to the floor. Really, but... already? I thought we were just getting going. Yeah, no, Is I it because I said bullshit? I, uh, no, oh, no. <laughs> I'm allowed to argue you, back, right? I, of course I mean, you, got, you are. That's you got, the best what way. What you've got in your brain right now is partly a result of crypto Twitter. It's like noise coming in that's just like... I don't know why this world does not, is so threatened by an actual, a portrayal of the actual okay, person. Okay, but, but let me ask a question of you and, and how you relate to him. He isn't like a lot of the contrarians or oddballs that perhaps you've written about in the past. If we think about Billy Bean in Moneyball, for instance, you know, use data and analytics to build a winning baseball team, was out on his own, out on a limb, similarly Michael Burry in The Big Short. Sam bankman fried doesn't fit into that mold. Has he taken you by surprise? He's not quite the sort of underdog, the hero. I would never, you know, I get, other people misdescribe my books. Uh, if you look at the characters in the big short, some of them are quite problematic characters. And so I don't, I'm not looking for a hero, ever. That's, it's the last thing from my mind. If I'm looking, when I'm looking at characters, when you say, and I've gotten more character driven. What am I looking for? Fun is one of the things I'm looking but for. But is it fun? $8 billion is, is miss, appears to be missing people or in court. You know what? So it's getting more interesting than that. You say that, $8 billion. How much do you think is actually missing? I don't know. No you don't idea. know. So here, I'll tell you how much is actually missing. And this is where it's getting really odd. So the bankruptcy people have, show, have, have said that there's $8.6 billion in missing customer deposits. And that as of June, they had located 7.3 billion, and it wasn't like clawbacks, it was just there. 7.3 billion, so it's 1.3 billion that's missing. Plus, it, and they said there's still it's more to be found. Number, hold on, hold billion. on. Will you hold on? This is where, it, to, today, today, the prosecution, the prosecution sent a motion to the court saying, can we please not talk about the possibility that customers are all gonna get their money back? And, the, and, and that in particular, can we, you gonna let me finish? I am. You want, do you come care? On, come on, I've got one more. I, I need to no, let no, them hold in. On. Do you care how much is missing? I think what I care you about care. is the fact that at the very least, he's Because you thought it was important, extra- but now you no, don't I, think no, it's important. No, I do think it's important. I think at the very least, he's irresponsible. Of course. He's- I'm not saying he's not irresponsible. I'm saying it's just different than you think. So well, I'm going to finish my thought. This is where it gets very cool. So he bought, he bought to the outrage of his colleagues, a 20% stake in an AI company called Anthropic, along with several hundred other venture capital investments. This, this stake looks like it's now valued at, well, the company, when he bought it, was valued at a couple of billion dollars. The, uh, the company now looks like it's valued at $30 billion. And the prosecution does not want the jury to know that, my God, they're all going to get their money back. Now, it's, it may be irrelevant from a legal point of view, but from a social point of view, and from the point, I'm a creditor, I had money on his exchange, I care about that. So I think it's, I think it's relevant and may speak to intent. Um, as for my, like, what I look for, the number one thing is, are they gonna teach us about the world? And are they, one, themselves good teachers and explainers? And he's a very good explainer and teacher. But are two, is there, are there circumstances revealing us to us things about the world? And the reason, we, I didn't write a word about this, of this book. I didn't, wasn't even sure I had a book uh, until November, until it all fell apart. But I didn't write a word about it until January. So it's not like there are words in this book that got made up before it all went mm. bad. Um, that, that I was, it's the Sam Bankman fried shaped hole. This is a bizarre situation. He goes from nothing to having $22 billion in 18 months. The whole world reshapes itself around him in ways that are telling you about the world. He, he, and then when it all collapses, all the people who were with him turn on him. All the media that was with him turn on him. The, and he's continuing to light up the world in an interesting way. So that's what appeals to me. It isn't, is he a hero? Is, can he tell us things? Okay, one final one for me, which is really important, um, which is how did this fraud happen? What was the fraud, the alleged fraud? So, 
Uh, so the, um, everybody agrees on this. This is like the defense, the, all the lawyers in the courtroom agree on this, that uh, roughly $10 billion of customer deposits that were meant to be in cold storage on, this, on FTX, the exchange, were in fact in his, the, that hedge fund he starts as his first business, Alameda Research, which is in a little hut beside the exchange in the Bahamas. And the, the question is, there's not even much question about how it got there. So there were two mechanisms. Um, the first was when FTX began, this is going to probably bore everybody. Should I do this? It's do it as briefly as you can. It is, it is important it's is okay. it, to understand okay. that well, all this so, huge so amount of money was I'll try to be quick. So um, when it started, FTX couldn't get bank accounts, not because it was illegal, but because banks were rightly very suspicious about banking crypto operations. They had banked Alameda, partly because Alameda had disguised it was a crypto operation. Mm. So if you wanted to send your pounds into FTX so you could buy some crypto, the bank account you sent it to was Alameda. And $8.8 .8 billion piles up this way before FTX gets its bank accounts. Then that mechanism for that money piling up in Alameda vanishes. The other thing that happens is um, in the very beginning, of the exchange. Um, so every other customer on FTX is, is not allowed really to put the exchange at risk. This has been a problem in crypto. These exchanges have gone down over and over because customers come in, make big bets, they, loo they lose and they don't have the money to cover the bets. And the exchange and the customers end up covering the bets. And whole exchanges go down for this reason. One of the, ironically, the big selling point for FTX was they had built a, a risk engine that made sure that, okay, if you riddle it, come in and you put down 10 quid to buy 100 quid worth of Bitcoin, that before you lose your 10 quid in your Bitcoin trade, they take you out of the trade. Mm. So nobody's going to lose money. They switched the engine off for Alameda traders. So Alameda had the right to lose basically unlimited sums. And there's two or three billion dollars that get into Alameda, essentially borrowings from Alameda that, through that mechanism. So those are the two mechanisms for the first. Then the question is, and this we're not going to go into because it's going to take forever, but the, law, the, the, the details of the how and the why and the spirit in which they did it, in which the trial will, re will reveal. But okay. yes. Look, as you can tell, I could keep talking probably until tomorrow morning. So, but I want to throw it open to you guys just to remind you, roving mics down here uh, in the hall downstairs, two fixed mics up there. Downstairs, when the mic comes to you, if you can stand up when you ask your question. If you're watching online, then please, please type your questions into the box below and uh, we will, I will definitely ask them. I can see them here in front of me. I'm going to go, yes, there's a, a lady there and I'll take, what I'll do is I'll take three. So I'll take you and there's a gentleman behind you. So go with that first. Go on, go for it. Hello. Hi. Uh, so sorry, I'm taking a step back from this specific story, but I'm, I didn't expect to be the first one <laughs> to be selected. But I'm more curious curious about your writing uh, process in general, and you have been so successful in telling the stories of real people in a compelling way to the level that they have been adopted for uh, movies. What do you think is in your book and in your style of a storytelling that makes, makes your story so compelling? Okay. And there's a gentleman behind you there. Yeah. You were mentioning that it looks like possibly all of the creditors will get their money back. They may. Well, they might, they yeah. might. Um, what about the, the charities, the organizations, the long-termist and effective altruist organizations to whom they had promised billions of dollars? There were projects that were already gearing up to having been funded. Yeah. I'm just wondering if, you know, what might happen to those? Because some of them are completely done for. Yeah. Mm. So, effective altruists, organizations that might have got money that will no longer. And what is it, do you think, that makes your writing, your books, so compelling? You, what order do you want me to take them? Any order you like. It's hard to remember both at once, but all right. Uh, so, sure you're okay. Um, so, that's the second one, because that's a, the, 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 the effect, I'll start with that. The effective altruist, um, uh, the, the, the donations. So there's an interesting intellectual exercise that needs to be done inside the bankruptcy that has not been done and that John Ray, the person running it, said would be, would be done, but it hasn't been done, um, told me it would be done. And the, 
that in order to, so there are two problems with the people who've been given money. The people who've actually been given money face the prospect of having it clawed back by the bankruptcy. That's one kind of problem. And then there are people who thought they were going to get money and the money doesn't show. I don't think it's, I don't think that second pot is actually billions, but there are some. I've heard from them. And that's just sad, and they're not going to get any money. They, they, it was, if it, it was promised or it was hoped for, and it's not going to be there. But the, the curiouser pile is, oh, you already got, he gave away, I don't know, three or $400 million, and did it in a, much of it in a very odd way. Um, they, they looked at the philanthropic model and said it's kind of busted. Like, that huge, in most philanthropies, huge amounts of money just go to sustaining the philanthropy, to bureaucracy costs, and, and to vetting proposals mm -hmm. and it, on subjects that you don't know that much about. So what they did is they had their buckets they were interested in. They were interested in mostly existential risk to humanity, but it was p pandemic prevention, it was uh, artificial intelligence, what, whatever the buckets were. They went out to individuals who they knew, understood, who were specialists, and said them, essentially, you might get an, out of the blue this email from FTX, here's a million dollars, give it away in the best way possible, just do it, and, and you can do it however you want, and we're not going to monitor it, and just tell us what you did so we can just track to see how effective this was. So there were several hundred people who got that email and gave that money away, yeah. but, but it means that the gifts were in pretty small amounts, and I don't think worth the while of the bankruptcy to try to go get. So I don't think they're going to claw it back. But the intellectual exercise they have to engage in to claw it back is to prove that when the money was given away, FTX was actually bankrupt. And the, the question is, when was FTX bankrupt? Right. It, it, it certainly wasn't bankrupt in February of last year. It was, it, there, was, there was triple or double the number of customer deposits there. there was, so there's some moment, either when crypto collapses, or maybe it's not even until November of last year, when you could actually prove that it was bankrupt. And if they can't prove it was bankrupt, they can't claw it back. So I, I don't, the only people who've given back money are people who are embarrassed by it, the money, the politicians, kind of. They've been a bit of that, but they don't have to give the money back. And I would love to see someone fight it, because I think you're going to probably get to the, the, the argument's going to be, it's going to be somewhere, it's going to be pretty late in the day in FTX's life before it's actually bankrupt. Uh, writing process. Like why, do you want me to ask, explain why they get made into movies or just why like my books sell? Uh, the, the, it, it both kind of, so the process is, I have asked myself this because I'm a curious creature as a writer. I don't, m most writers had a sense of themselves as writers pretty young. And I had no sense of myself as a writer until I got out of college. And nobody ever said, I swear to you, no one ever saw promise in me. No, one, no English teacher said, oh, you really have talent, you really should. I had no Walter Mitty-ish like fantasy, nothing. So never wrote for a school newspaper. So it's strange that my life has taken the course it's taken. What happened in my case was I became when I was a senior in college, wholly absorbed with a book-length thesis I had to write. And it turned out very, very well intellectually, not very well literarily. So poorly literarily that when I asked my professor, what do you think of the writing? He said, put it this way, never try to make a living at it. <laughs> but I, I, I did. I did try to make a living at it. And, and I did it because it was the one thing I'd ever done that could be construed as work that during which I lost track of time. And it was here in London. I was living up in Hampstead, and our St. John's Wood first, but then Hampstead. And then I would, I, would, I don't know why I had to need to make that distinction, but the, but, but, but. <laughs> they are quite different. <laughs> yeah, I know they're different, but, but I can remember hours would pass. I'd write some article that would be rejected by some place, and hours would pass, and I wouldn't know it had passed. I also noticed that when I wrote letters to people in a more, in a real self-conscious way, like here's what's going on in London now, they would get passed around. Like, you know, I would come back home, go home to New Orleans and people would come up and say, I read that letter you wrote your mother, it's all over the place, it's funny. And I thought, well, people want, people want to read me. They, 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 will, they will read me. Um, so I had, I, and I think, it, I think, to the extent there was any ability, it was some kind of voice on the page that I can't explain and that would never have been identified by um, academia. 
at any school at any point because they don't ask for voice. They ask for, you know, a, a thesis statement and a blah, blah, blah. And you're never yourself in school. But when I was myself on the page, it somehow worked. And I don't want to know why. It just like works and I don't want to stop. Um, but for the subjects, like why the things work, I, this, this is, this is going to sound like bullshit, but I think it's true. I'm basically an incredibly lazy person. Like left, I'm in, you know, an object at rest will remain, remain at rest. I will remain at rest longer than any other object. That I just don't, I don't have an impulse to work. So for something to get my attention to the point where I'll get off my ass and actually do something about it, it's got to be really exciting. I get really, as you can tell, I get really worked up about the subjects. So I'm, it's passing through a filter to get to the point where I'm going to write about it. I'm not going to just write a book to write a book. Right now, I may never write another book again. Like, I don't care if I, I would like to, but I, I don't care that much. I'm prepared that that's, I've never found a subject that will excite me again, and I won't do it ever again. The fact that, like, I, it has to rouse me, I think, gets me to a place with the reader where it rouses the reader, too. I also think that as for not, as it's, it's a, this genre I work in is a particularly American genre. It's heavily, heavily reported. Like people think I just have an opinion about Sam Bankman Freed. I don't have an opinion, or, or my opinion is earned anyway. It's a year and a half of hundreds of hours of immersion, not just with him, but everything around him. And I don't, I wouldn't, if you'd asked me after six months, write a book, I couldn't have done it. I, 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 this is a funny thing. The day before FTX collapsed, I was with a very famous film director who has become a kind of friend, who I use as a sounding board for story because I admire his story, his story instincts. And I said to him, I got this problem. I've spent a year and two months marinating in this world. And I described Sam the character. I described a bunch of scenes. I said, I've got all this stuff but I don't have a story and I can't figure out why I don't have a story. And he said, you don't have a story because you don't have a third act. There's no ending to this. And I said, that's exactly, that's exactly right. And it's also right that I don't know how to start it unless I know how it ends. Like I've had books where I know the last sentence. I knew the last, like the last words of this book before I wrote the first words of the book. Sometimes it changes, but sometimes I actually am navigating to a point I know. And I know where to navigate to. So I was prepared at that moment not to write the book. And uh, it, it wasn't until I was a, I absolutely like had it in the bag and was sure that I even bothered to sit down and write the book. And I think that helps. I think that like the walk away ability, like don't do it unless it actually feels right as a story, really helps with the, with the readers and probably with the movies too, because it gives them some structure.